So last week, uh, Jesus preaches the gospel in his hometown Nazareth and everyone gets upset with him. So upset that they actually try to kill him. So uh, what was the problem? Why were, they, why were they so upset? Well, there was two things, wasn't there? First, they didn't really like the idea that Gentiles, these non-Jewish people, would be welcomed into the kingdom of God without first becoming Jews. And secondly, they were upset because he wouldn't do the miracles that he had been doing in Capernaum. So, what does Jesus do? He leaves Nazareth, goes back to Capernaum, and does a load of miracles. And at this point, we're like, Jesus, you're just trying to wind them up. What's going on? What's all this about? Why won't he do these signs and miracles in Nazareth, but he does them in Capernaum? Well, it's because Nazareth didn't want them as a sign. They wanted them as the thing. You know, we're Jewish, you're the Jewish Messiah. Chop, chop, come on. Let's get on with this Isaiah 61 stuff you've been reading. And uh, give us some healing, free us from some bondage, and all that Messiah stuff you meant to do. But he won't do it for them. Because they thought that the sign, the miracle was a sign, they thought that that was the whole thing, the whole purpose of him coming. But a sign is a sign. It's not the thing that it is a sign of. So if you go to the zoo and you walk around the main concourse, you walk around the main kind of, there's usually a main circuit, isn't there, and then all branches off. And if you walk around the main concourse and you see all the signs and you see, you know, that little white outline of a gorilla, you look, there's a gorilla, whoop! And then you go home, you kind of miss the point of the zoo, haven't you? That's the sign. It's not the actual thing that you've come to see. And the miracles that Jesus does is a sign. A sign of what? A sign of the kingdom of God. So if you go to the zoo and get really excited about the white outline of a lion on a sign, you might, if you think that's amazing, boy, just wait until you meet the king of the jungle. The kingdom of God is far greater than the signs that point to it. Jesus wants us to be obsessed with that, with the kingdom of God, not the signs of his kingdom. So this morning we're thinking, what is the kingdom of God and how do we get into it? Let's look at the text. So we might ask then, why does Jesus do all of these amazing signs in the first place? I mean, if the sign isn't the thing, why have them? I mean, if, if the ultimate goal of Jesus' ministry is the cross, bearing the sins of the world, why all of this? Quite frankly, why the three years of his ministry? Why didn't he go straight from baptism to temptation to the next week, the cross? Why didn't he go straight to the cross? What is the purpose of all of this? Well, Jesus is validating, he is showing that he is the fulfillment of the coming promised Messiah. Sometimes people speak of Jesus' miracles as if they were just proof that he was God, as if they were some just generic display of power. Look, see, I'm a God, follow me. But no, Jesus is saying, I am the God. I am. It's not just look, I'm God, but look, I'm fulfilling the promises of all that the Messiah was to be. You see, a generic display of divine power would mean nothing to the people of Capernaum. We might find that impressive, you know, if somebody rocked them into Halifax and started doing all these sorts of things, we'd be like, there's generally something going on here. We might find it impressive, but that's only because modern humanity is so far removed from a genuinely spiritual worldview that we have very little, no experience of, of supernatural powers, but they were relatively familiar with the supernatural worlds. We just need to think about the magicians in Egypt that they'd read about, it wasn't that long ago. 
Those weren't fake, though, but they weren't from God, those powers. They were evil spiritual powers. There are lots of, I mean, even in the New Testament time, they speak of you know, Simon the sorcerer, as if it was quite normal. There are lots of powers and authorities. Jesus simply giving a display of divine power does him no good. Generic divine power is a sign of the supernatural world, but it's not necessarily a sign of the kingdom of God. And that we must bear in mind very carefully. But what Jesus does isn't a sign of some generic display of power. These wonders have a very specific role in fulfilling the promises of the Messiah. And the people could tell, couldn't they? They saw how genuine Jesus' power and authority was. Look at verse 31. He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. I don't know, maybe you know what it's like if you see, if you see a, a fake Rolex or some fake designer clothes. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, uh, to be honest. But I'd be able to tell if you put a fake one next to a genuine one. Yep, you, know, you might see the fake, oh, that's pretty good. But when you see it next to the real deal, you see how tinny and fake the fake is. And that's Jesus, isn't it? They had all heard teaching before. They had probably even seen some miracles, some supernatural events, uh, demon possession and exorcisms and the like. But Jesus was different gravy. He spoke with his own authority. See, they were used to hearing rabbis who only ever repeated what some other rabbi had said. They spoke on others' authority. But Jesus, verse 32, his words possessed their own authority. And likewise, in verse 35, when he commands the demon out, he doesn't say, in the name of, does he? He just says, get out, because he has his own authority. Be silent. And the demon obeys him. And this is interesting, right? A couple of things here I find interesting uh, straight off the bat. The first one being there's a demon in church. What's that about? What do we make of this? I mean, for a start, we have to say, don't we? There is way more, way more demonic activity around Jesus than we will ever experience or expect to experience for a number of reasons, which we're not going to get into this morning. But I mean, one reason would be the church is now worldwide and has spread geographically around the world and there's no new demons there's no new ones so they've got more work to do you know we're not going to see what we see here as this concentration of demonic activity surrounds Jesus so this isn't normative for us this isn't what we expect at all but it was for Jesus do you remember when Jesus was out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil and what did we say when, when, the de when Jesus resisted the devil, we said, you know, Satan's like, right, fine, I can't get you. Where's my next target? I'm going to get your bride. I'm going to get your church. And here he is in the church. But the second, perhaps surprising thing, is the demons recognize Jesus before anyone else does. And how do they respond to him? Well, they respond with belief, don't they? And this is really important as we ask ourselves, how do we respond to Jesus and his kingdom authority? We read it just a few weeks ago, didn't we, in James. Uh, we read that even demons have faith in Jesus. James chapter 2, verse 19. James says, you believe that God is one, you confess that God is one, good for you, big whoop. Even the demons do that, and at least they have the courtesy to shudder. What was James talking about? He was talking about real faith and fake faith, wasn't he? So there's this real faith that the demons don't have, this fake faith, this uh, not real faith that they do have. Uh, and he points out that, that they have this, what we might call historic faith, but they don't have what we call saving faith. Because what does the demon say here in verse 34? He says, ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demon recognizes Jesus 
of, as the Holy One of God. He knows who he is and he knows where he's from. He has what we might call historic faith. He believed the historical account, the facts of who Jesus was. But he didn't trust him. It's the sort of faith that many people have in Jesus. It's the sort of false faith that too many in church have. The wrong thinking that knowing about or even knowing Jesus is enough. I've heard it said, and I've even said it myself, um, it's not enough to know about Jesus, you have to know him. But do you know what? I don't think even that is quite accurate enough to be a reliable saying. Because it's not about knowledge at all. It's not even just about knowing him, it's about trusting him, having faith in him. So I believe that Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister, okay? And I could know lots of things about him, and I don't, but let's just say for the sake of this, I could even know him. I, we could be on WhatsApp together, couldn't we? Yeah? And yet, I could know about him, I could know him, and I could, eat, I could still not like him at all. Eh? And I may not like him. Knowing his authority, and even recognising his authority over me, doesn't mean I have confidence in it. That's the relationship that the demons have with Jesus. What relationship do you have with Jesus? You may believe the facts about who Jesus is. You may even recognize he is sovereign. He has authority. But do you love that authority? Do you love him? Are you glad that he has the authority that he has? And do you trust him that he will use that authority for your good? Do you want nothing more than to be with Jesus and to be in his kingdom? It's not enough to know about Jesus. Do you love him? Do you trust him? Do you believe his promises? Very simply, the difference between uh, historic faith and saving faith is this. Historic faith can say, I believe Jesus was born, died, rose and ascended. And then to make it saving faith, we just add, for me, for me. And this is really important as we think about the Old Testament saints, those people who are Christians in the Old Testament. Because saving faith is about trusting the promises of God in Jesus, not knowledge. So Adam and Eve knew nothing of Bethlehem. They didn't know the serpent crusher would be born there, but they did believe he would be born for them. Abraham knew nothing of crucifixion but he believed the true son would die for him. Job didn't know that Jesus would come back to life in the tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, but he believed the resurrection was for him. Daniel didn't know the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples at the ascension, but he did believe that Jesus would ascend and rule for his good. I don't believe the Old Testament saints spoke better than they knew. I think they understood exactly what they spoke. And who they spoke of was Jesus. They didn't know all the historic details. In that sense, the demons know more than they did. But they trusted the promises of God. They trusted Jesus. Boys and girls... More information on the Bible, more Bible knowledge is great. More knowledge about Jesus and his word is wonderful. But it's not enough to just know about him. You need to trust him. It's not just enough to know about the death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. You have to believe the promises that are attached to those things. Jesus shows that he is the Messiah with signs and wonders that fulfill the Old Testament. He has come to proclaim the year of the Lord and to set at liberty those who are oppressed by bringing them into the kingdom of God. 
This is what he's done in a very real and vivid sense here as he heals a man from this demon. And this is a really significant event which is recorded here in Luke's Gospel. It's also recorded in Mark's Gospel. Because do you know, this is the first time in the entire Bible that we read about a demon being cast out from someone. It's the first time. And again, this tells us how unusual this is. This is very specific to Jesus' day. And a few years afterwards, didn't happen much at all before, doesn't happen with any regularity now. No such event is recorded in the Old Testament. So what's going on here? Why now? Why is this significant? Well, the defeat of demons following immediately on from Jesus' victory over Satan's temptation marks the beginning of the re-establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And Jesus makes this connection really clear in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. He says... If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is a re-establishment of God's kingdom on earth. In the temptations, the devil told Jesus, speaking truly, he said, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. All you need to do is bow to me. Well, Jesus doesn't need to bow. He'll just take them. He'll just take them back from the devil. Jesus' ministry marked the beginning of the repossession of the nations that were distributed at Babel. Jesus shows clearly he's undoing all of that mess in the Old Testament. All that mess that has come before. He'll undo all the mess of our lives today. He's bringing about God's kingdom upon the earth. But what is the kingdom of God? When we think of a kingdom, we might think of a place, you know, uh, the magical kingdom. Is that Disneyland, I think, Disney World, something like that, I don't know. You know, um, we might think of the United Kingdom, it's where we are right now. But a kingdom is not so much about a, a location, but about an authority. So let's just say, if this is something we're allowed to do these days, this afternoon I got on a plane and I go to America. Now I would have left Great Britain but I would still be a subject of the United Kingdom. I would still be under the rule of the Queen. She would still be my Queen, and I'd still be one of her subjects, and my passport would say as much. Even though I'd gone, I'd still be under the rule of the United Kingdom. In a similar way, God's kingdom is not a place, though it is expressed and seen in places. It's a rule and an authority wherever you are, If you are in the kingdom of God, you are under his rule and authority. So how do I know if I'm in the kingdom of God? If it's not a place, I can... Ta-da! I'm in it. Yeah? I can know I'm here because I'm here. Where can it be found? Well, there's two answers to this, really. First of all, technically, uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 17... That you are not in the kingdom of God, but that the kingdom of God is in you. Isn't that amazing? Jesus reigns in you. So in one sense, you can't leave it. It just goes with you where you are. At your baptism, the Holy Spirit made you his temple and he dwells in you. And therefore he dwells in us. And this is a second answer, and honestly, it's a lot easier for us to get our heads around. That's why Jesus set it up this way. How do I know if I'm in the kingdom of God? Because you're in church. Church is the kingdom of God. And by that, of course, I don't mean a building on a Sunday, although it does often mean us coming to a building on a Sunday. I mean, you are a member of a local church actively living out the commands of the Bible, accountable to a local fellowship. That's how you know. Look, there's a Christian. I know them. I talk to them. They love me. I pray for them. They'll rebuke me. I'll rebuke them. We're in the kingdom together. Look, there's the table. There's the bread and the wine. The word's open. I'm in the kingdom of God. I believe it. The kingdom of God is... The church, which in itself is a miracle. 
Uh, maybe not in the strictly technical, theological textbook kind of meaning, but yeah, look at it. This is a miracle. And what I mean by that is that there's no way this could happen without Jesus' mighty work. There's no way you lot would want to come and spend time with me every week. I'm pretty annoying. I know that much. Yeah? There's no way you'd want to li listen to me and love me. It's only because the Spirit's working in you. It's a miracle. People today still talk about miracles and healing as if they were the thing that the church is about. But it's nothing compared to this. This is the thing. This is the real thing. This is the kingdom of God. The miracles that Jesus did were just a sign of this, pointing to this. And so I'm not saying that miracles and healing don't ever happen, but why would we desire, above all things, those old signs when we have the actual thing here? In your baptism, you are washed clean of your sin. It's not just a sign. Something actually happens there. Equally, each week we come to the table and Jesus gives us his body and his blood and the forgiveness of sins. We believe the promises that are fulfilled by Jesus in these things. The kingdom of God is the reversal of the fallen world. So in church we are not scattered and sent away from God but brought in together. We're washed clean in baptism and we are forgiven and fed at the supper. What does he reverse the fallen world for? What is the purpose of the kingdom of God? Let's close by finish by looking at Peter's mum. I know he's technically his mother-in-law. I'm going to call him his mum. I think, I think he would have called her mum. Uh, that's who we have here, by the way, in verse 38. Simon Peter's mum. Simon's mum. It's, it's Peter, the disciple. It's his mum, his mother-in-law. And she's sick. And so Jesus comes and he heals her. But it does more than just heal her, doesn't he? I think we can say he restores her. And what does God do as he reverses the kingdom of Satan and restores the kingdom of God in us? He restores us to service. We read here that Peter's mum had a high fever. Uh, and the language here indicates it's getting worse. It's serious. Um, she's not in bed with a cold. It's the sort of illness that in those days led to death. And, and honestly, sometimes in these days, it still does, doesn't it? And when Jesus heals her, he doesn't just make her feel better. He doesn't just stop the illness or take away the illness. He completely restores her. We all know what it's like, don't we, some of us this week, uh, to know what it's like to be ill in bed. Uh, either, you know, whether it's just like, you know, feeling very poorly or even seriously ill. And uh, you know what it's like, even if you've just been kind of fluey, you, you've eventually you feel better, the fever leaves, the sickness stops, the headache goes. Let me ask you, when that happens, do you feel immediately well enough to get up and look after a party of guests? Or is it more like, I'll just be upstairs, there's cold pizza in the fridge, help yourself. It's more that one, isn't it? It's more that one. Usually the illness goes and there's a recovery time. But Jesus... When he heals Peter's mum, he doesn't just take the illness away. He restores her health completely. Because that's what he does. That's what Jesus does. That is what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He doesn't just remove your sin. I mean, that's hard enough, right? We love it. We cling to it. He doesn't just remove our sin, but he restores righteousness. He gives us his life. Jesus takes away our sickness and sin. He removes our disconnection and he restores holiness. He sets us apart for what? We see it in Peter's mum, the service. I love Peter's mum. I think she's great. You sometimes hear people say things like this and, and maybe we've said them or thought them ourselves, you know, either after a debilitating sickness or a, a near-death experience or getting out of a bad relationship or getting out of a bad situation. We can be tempted to say and think things like, oh, that's given me a new lease of life. Uh, I really appreciate life now, uh, so I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to make the most of it. Okay, that's all well and good. But then people say, so, you know what? I'm going to look after myself. 
I, I've done, you know, I'm not going to pour myself into other people. I've done that. I'm going to live for myself now. I'm going to live for number one for a while. And then they plan all these grand gestures. They go on holiday. They travel. They buy themselves extravagant things. They live free, whatever that means. Because, you know, isn't that what life is really all about? It's almost like before the event, whatever it was, they were quietly getting on with their lives, looking after other people, looking after the kids, their husband, the dog, whatever it may be. But that wasn't living. But now I see, and now I'm going to do something grand. Now I'm really going to live. We see it all the time, don't we? People around us. But there's a Christian version of this as well. It can happen either after an illness, or even after conversion, or some other significant event. And it goes like this. Now that God has saved me from death, or now, well, yeah, either physical or spiritual, now I'm really going to serve the Lord. I'm going to go and be a missionary. I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to go into full-time ministry. And the implication is, before, I was just serving my children and my husband. I was just focused on looking after my wife. I was only doing a good job and serving my employer. I was only taking meals around to sick people at church. I was only invested in other people's lives in my church and community. I was only praying for people and listening to them and walking with them and loving them and teaching my children to love Jesus and the church. I was only coming to church each week and receiving the word and the sacrament. I was only inviting my neighbours to church so they could meet with a living God. I was only. As if they were onlys and not everything's. We might think they are onlys, but Jesus doesn't. These are everything in the kingdom of God. So often we think of um, uh, the, the things we think of as big things, as significant things, is just somebody doing exactly the same thing as we're doing, just somewhere else. I don't know why we think that other people's service somewhere else is somehow of more value to God than us doing this, that thing that he's called us to do here, in the place he's called us to do it. Why is telling somebody about Jesus halfway across the world more significant than telling it to your child in your house, or your spouse, or your neighbour, or your colleague? Peter's mum, I love her, she got up and she got on, serving others, which is probably her normal thing day in, day out. Like she's just been healed by the living God. And she's not like, right, I'm... She's like, well, who wants tea? Who wants tea? She didn't get up and be like, right, bye, Peter. You look after yourself and your friends. I'm going to go and do something with real meaning now. Because that's not how Jesus sees it. When they came and asked Jesus, will you, will you heal my, my mum? He doesn't say... Uh, well, um, I mean, yeah, I can, can do. I mean, is she a doctor or a teacher? Is she doing something significant? doesn't ask that question, does he? Well, well, well no, Jesus, but she looks after people in her home. Well, okay, I mean, I could, but does she promise to then do something worthwhile? He doesn't do that, does he? He's like, no, that's right, she needs to be healed because she can serve these people. Of course. Everyday life and faith is what we are restored to. Life in church. God has restored you. He's given you life. And he's brought you into the kingdom of God. Into his church. So that you may do the genuinely remarkable thing. The world changing thing of receiving the word and the sacraments. That you may do the genuinely world changing thing of serving each other in church. Worshipping him. And inviting people in. To know the living God. This is what it looks like to live with the kingdom of God in you. And we finish. It's the Sabbath. And so the Jews wouldn't travel on the Sabbath. Which is why we get this kind of funny influx at the end of the story. 
The day is done, the, the night has come, this, the Jewish day ended as the sun came down, it was the end of Sabbath, so all these people had heard that Jesus was there, so they flock in from the other side of town, from other towns, and they all come, and Jesus would have been knackered. After a full day of teaching, and preaching, and healing, and telling people about the kingdom of God, and doing the signs that point to them, and he probably wants to go to his bed, he wants to go straight to that desolate place, but he waits for them, because he loves them. The sick, tired, weary, depressed, and oppressed of the world come. And what does he do? He lays hands on them. He touches them. Uh, it's been ne never a time in my life has been more apparent than now, but we, we like to keep our distance from sickness, don't we? We keep our distance because sickness spreads, right? Health doesn't spread. If you're feeling poor, you don't say, Dougie, come around and give me a bit of your health. The way it's going to work is you're going to give me a bit of your sickness. If you're in well, I'm healthy. It doesn't go that way, does it? We have put the world into such a condition with our sin where it is sickness and sin and shame that spreads. But Jesus is not under the kingdom of this world. He is the king of the kingdom of God. And he's come to undo all of the fall. And so his touch brings holiness and healing. He doesn't get sick, he, but he does take the sickness. He takes the sickness. His hands take their sickness. Those same hands that were going to be nailed to the cross. And this is what the kingdom of God looks like. The sign of the man on the cross bearing the sins of the world, taking away your sin and shame. And so trust with true faith. Trust the promises of God that are given you in church, that are given to you in the word and the table. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.